Well, today, friends, family, colleagues, gentlemen of the press, we begin the next exciting chapter of Glastonbury. Nature seems dead, in quote marks, as you'll see right here. Maybe. Nature seems dead. What does that mean, I wonder? During the first week in December, Three new subjects of the King of England entered this world in the little maternity annex of the Glastonbury Hospital. Nell Zoylan was delivered of a boy, while Tossie Stickles, to her immense pride and satisfaction, was delivered a pair of lusty girl twins. It was conductive of certain curious encounters that these two young women and their children should be lying simultaneously in private rooms opening from the same passage. Tom Barter, coming to visit Tossie, found himself confronted in that passage one day by Will Zoyland and another day by Sam Decker. While Miss Elizabeth Crow, who was devoted in her watchfulness over Toss and her twins, met on one in the same evening. Persephone Spear and Dave Spear coming to see Nell, but coming separately on this arrival on this errand. There's a period in there that's throwing me up. It's a typo, though. Something certainly seems, at least up to this present date, which is now the 10th of December, to be favoring the commune conspirators. Dave and Red and the new ally Paul Trent had evidently been well advised in their choice of a locale that day, wherein to broach their daring plot. Philip Crow, like many another Napoleonic tactician, was weakest in the cautious consideration of all probable and improbable thin contingencies. Like the impetuous Carsican, and like Oliver Cromwell, he swept ahead upon his main idea, allowing sleeping dogs to sleep and open stable doors to remain open. Never for one second did it cross his active brain any more than across the brain of Tilly, absorbed in making her domestic arrangements for the winter, or the brain of Mr. Tankerville, growing more and more energetic in his commercial flights about Europe, that there was the least chance of any difficulty over his factory leases, the rents of which remain still only paid up to the beginning of the new year. The construction of his new road and his new bridge was for the moment held up by the flat refusal of Mr. Twig to sell any portion of his small patrimony. But the ever creech man, more anxious than ever to serve this rich employer, since his father-in-law, an obstinate about dying as number one was about selling, still persisted in milking his four Jersey cows with his own hand, was already in correspondence with the county officials over the possibility of exploiting a section of Lake Village Field. You all that? But though handicapped over his road and his bridge, Philip had begun his tin mining under the most promising conditions, and already the sound of picks and mattocks and of cranes and engines could be heard proceeding from a big clearing in the hillside under which many unvisited subterranean passages led into the heart of the hill. Half a dozen truckloads of that precision precious metal had already been dispatched from the railway station of Glastonbury. For although the station was further off than the one in Wells, it was easier to make use of, and Philip had a made much stronger pull with the railroad officials there. It had been just a month ago, in the middle of November, when the first tin had begun to emerge nor would Philip ever forget his feeling when he beheld the lorry containing its roll off towards the great western station, ready to be taken to Cardiff through the Severn Tunnel. For the last month, the tin had been pouring forth with such a steady flow that Philip's spirits had mounted up to pitch of excitement that was like a kind of diurnal drunkenness. He dreamed of tin every night, the metal in its stages began to obsess him. He collected specimens of it, of every degree of weight, integrity, purity. He carried bits of it around with him in his pocket. All manner of quaint fancies, 
not so much imaginative ones as purely childish ones, connected with Tin, kept entering and leaving his mind, and he began to feel as if a portion of his innermost being were the actual magnet that drew this long neglected element out of abysses, abysses of prehistoric darkness and the light of day. Whew. Philip got into the habit of walking every day up the steep overgrown hillside above Wookie and posting himself in the heart of a small grove of scotch firs from which he could observe, without anyone detecting his presence, the lively transactions at the mouth of the big artifice of the earth, where the trees had been cut away, and when the cranes and pulleys stood out in such startling relief against the ancient sepia-colored clumps of hazel and sycamore still growing around them upon the leafy slopes. Here he would devour the spectacle of all this activity he had set in motion, until he longed to share the physical exertions at every one of his laborers, diggers, machinists, truckmen, carters, stokers, miners, and haulers. He yearned to be himself boring, dynamiting, shoveling, lifting, carrying, driving, and so intensely had he fixed his eyes on every bodily movement these men had made that by this time of the 10th of December, he really could have hired himself out and won commendation from his foreman in the job and almost every one of these several laborers. It must not be supposed that he had neglected his office work or his dye works extensions and increased European sales during these exciting weeks. He worked steadily at the office from nine to every uh, to one every day and always looked in these again about five before he went home to tea. After his tea, he had recently required the custom of retiring to a room, which Emma could call the study, Tilly the north room and he himself the playroom. Shut up in this room, he used to ponder long and deeply over his affairs, plunging into various mathematical and commercial calculations and making rapid notes in a big, full-scap-sized notebook with a white vellum binding. This notebook has been given to him by Persephone when he, she was quite a little girl. Illuminated upon its front page was his name and hers united by a gift, gilt border within which were lilac-colored hearts strung about a green string. On this 10th of December, Philip returned to the north room after Tilly had gone to bed and gave himself up to an orgy of concentrated thought. He had already brought so many new laborers and working people into Glastonbury that it had begun to be difficult to house them, and Philip, little dreaming with a deadly blow was prepared for him from that quarter, had entered into negotiations with the town council relative to his housing these newcomers in some of the newly built council houses. The fact that there were so many unemployed among the old established Glastonbury people we now saw these lively upstarts from Bristol and Cardiff occupying houses provided by their own socialistic government and built out of local taxes was a fact that did not redound to Philip's popularity with the populace. Glastonbury's populace was, as he proved in that mobbing of Lord P, not at all inclined to remain passive and patient when they once get a particular grievance lodged in their brain. And Philip had been surprised by the sullen look with which he was greeted whenever he had occasion to pass through the poorer portions of the town. He had even heard derisive jeering when he recently crossed, in his little open car, one of the outskirts of paradise. This extreme unpopularity into which he had fallen was another of these possible causes of catastrophe which Philip neglected. It was part of that element of sheer recklessness in him, to which reference has already been made, to hold public opinion in infinite contempt. He made enough towards those immediately dependent upon him. Philip was obviously devoid of imagination when it came to be question of people he had never seen. His small, hard, oblong head, very protruding at the back, and rather flat in the sides, where the ears clung so closely, had that particular look about it that old-fashioned military men's skulls have. As he pulled his chair around him in front of the fire, 
waving the vellum-bound notebook open on the table and sprinkled with cigarette ashes, which he had not bothered to blow away, he thought to himself quite calmly, It would be a good thing if the Glastonbury people would simply die off. Die off and leave their houses empty to make room for me to fill the town with a different type altogether. But they seem able to live on forever, feeding on mud and mist. Die, 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 quickly and have done with it. It was at that moment that he saw in the dead red coals of the fire a heap of dead people, dead heads and arms and legs and feet. It was a totally unreal illustration of the French Revolution that set him upon conjuring up this romantic spectacle. It was a picture that he had seen in some silly illustration of some cheap story. And the queer thing about it was that these people were not disfigured in any way. They were just dead. How about how these Christs and Buddhas, he thought to himself, ever reached the point of feeling that it was worth their whole while to save the human race is more than I can understand. I don't want to torture anyone. Here Philip's judgment of himself was absolutely correct, for there was less sadism in him than there was in Mr. Stilly or in Jimmy Rake or in Elfin Cantle. But it's impossible for me to understand this value of human life that some people make so much of. Once more he stared at the coals. And once more he saw in those red recesses that curious sentimental assembly of neatly dressed corpses with sad, peaceful, composed features led out in that artistic morgue. And then there flickered over his hollow eye sockets and over his hollow cheeks as he stared at that fire and stretched out his hands to it a grim smile, for he thought of what Tilly would say if she could read his thoughts at this moment. Tilly, good housekeeper as she was in her orderings of well-killed meat, could not bring himself to trap the smallest mouse. If kittens were, had been born in her house by the dozens, it would not only have been by the craftiest deception that Emma could have get her to get rid of one of them. What actually would Tilly say, he wondered, if she knew that I could cut off the heads of that poor, of all the poor of Glastonbury and fill their houses with a picked set of men and women who could really work, I'd do it tomorrow. As a matter of fact, if by lifting up my hand now... I could destroy these people and get this new population here straight tonight. I'd do it. Yes, and sleep quite soundly afterwards. One of the most interesting things about Philip, when he indulged in mental contemplations as he was doing now, was that the guileless unmaliciousness of his inhumanity. Though it never occurred to him to ask himself by what right could he condemn to death in his thoughts a whole section of his fellow townsmen, he derived no wicked pleasure from the idea of their death. His gray, black, closely cropped skull was as devoid of such notions as one of the mattocks of his workmen a Wookiee. His experience now in his silent house, with his open figure, fingering book on the table behind him, and these glowing coals in front of him, a delicious sense of soundness, compactness, integrity, and solitude. I am I, his whole being seemed to say. And the world is my clay and my mortar. Leaving these ill-nourished Glastonbury incompetents safe in their neat and artistic death pile, his thoughts now turned to what he regarded as the superstitions of the place. Yes, he would willingly, if he could, obliterate all these Gothic ruins, lay a good solid expanse of lead piping to drain Chalice Well, pull down that old tower from the tor and build a water tank up there, take out every twig, spring, root and branch of this corrupting thorn bush and really get set to work to have the best of tin center in the spot that existed anywhere in the world. Here again, in the matter of superstition, Philip's destructive desires were astonishingly unmalicious. Well, that's nice. A little time and happy little Philip's head. Well, that's it for Glassbury tonight. That was pretty quick, huh? See you again next time. Cheers.